This is Dr. Steve Cheney, and tonight I'm going to talk about the truth about genetically modified foods. Or, if you'd like a more whimsical title, perhaps we could call it GMOs, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Now, let me just put this in perspective for those of you that aren't familiar with what I do. I write health tips from the professor, dot, uh, health tips from the professor, and you can find that at www.healthtipsfromtheprofessor.com. And what I really like to do is to take on all the hype, the myths, and the lies that are out there on the internet, and, and you know, go behind those headlines that are often misleading, and look at the published studies behind the headlines, and really analyze the science from the viewpoint of a researcher, because I was, uh, I've uh, done research for 40 years, I'm a biochemist, and, and I'm a college professor. And I taught biochemistry and nutrition to medical students for 40 years. So I'm a scientist, I'm a professor. I go behind the headlines, I analyze the science to give you the truth about the, behind those headlines. The, the, really the facts that you can trust. And when you do subscribe to my website and get on the, get the weekly blogs, you're going to receive two free ebooks: The Three Things Every Successful Diet Must Do. And the second is The Myths of the Naysayers. So um, again, those are just hopefully you, if you're interested in you know, getting accurate information behind the headlines, sign up for health tips from the professor today. But let's get to the topic for tonight's talk. That's what's the truth about those genetically modified foods? And you know, to my way of thinking, the, the GMO debate is a lot like Washington politics. On one side of the aisle, you have people saying that anything GMO is terrible. It's going to make you sick. It might even kill you. Uh, they show pictures of dead cows, you know, rotting um, in, in, in the, you know, on the, on the, on the farm, and, all, and, and dead rats, and, you know, all of these sorts of things. And it makes it sound like it's absolutely terrible. But on the other side of the aisle, you have people, proponents, that say there are no, absolutely no problems with GMO foods. So, you know, and the problem is, that both sides agree that the other side has nothing intelligent to say. So that's why I say it's kind of like Washington politics. But that means that anything I say tonight is bound to offend somebody, but then nobody ever accused me of being bashful. So let's go ahead and get started. What we're going to cover tonight, I'm going to talk about what the GMO labeling laws that are out there propose to regulate. And I'll sort of pull my punches ahead of time. Um, I'm in favor of a lot of what the GMO labeling laws propose, but my, I think they go too far, and they start to regulate things that probably shouldn't be regulated. Um, so to, to, to get to the background of that, I'm going to help you sort out what's hype and what's reality. By that I mean scientifically accurate information about the risk of genetically modified foods. And I'm going to break that down into health risks, environmental risks, and agricultural risks. And then we'll, come, we'll double back and talk about what might be the unintended consequences of the GMO labeling laws if they go forward as they're currently proposed, and what the future holds. And of course, that uh, I can speak to the scientific validity of things that are already published, already out there. But in the future, of course, I'm looking into a crystal ball. Now let's start with, you know, what are the major genetically modified crops in, in this country? If you're familiar with genetic modification, you probably know this already. If you're talking about corn, soy, cotton, canola, sugar beet, um, you know, 90% or more of the crops grown in this country are already genetically modified. You might not know that papaya is largely genetically modified, and even squash um, is more and more frequently being genetically modified. And when you look at the kind of modification, um, I have you know, classified them in different categories. So herbicide resistance, I put in red, because now you not only have the genetic modification, you have the concerns about all that herbicide that's being sprayed on our fields, perhaps getting in their water supply, perhaps being, have, leaving residues on the food that we're eating. Um, on the other hand, the ones in black where we're talking about pest resistance, um, those are ones that actually decrease the amount of uh, insecticides that need to be sprayed on those crops. 
So there, there's a there's a basic difference in them, and I'll go back into go into that more detail as we move along. So let me go to the first question. What do the GMO, the genetically modification labeling laws, propose to regulate? Well, they propose to make sure that every every kind of genetically modified food is labeled as genetically modified. They also want to regulate and, and label the protein that's made from genetically modified foods. But they go on from there and say any food component from genetically modified crops, whether it's a sugar or starch, an emulsifier, a thickener, a fat, an oil, all of these things, if they come from a genetically modified crop, they should be labeled as genetically modified and they should be considered as different than the uh, the same ingredients that come from non-genetically modified crops. And then finally, they, they tend that they want to classify nutrients that come from gen genetically modified microorganisms. And as we get into this, I'm going to propose that these different categories may be a little bit different, that lumping them all into one big category and say all of that stuff is genetically modified, all of it is equally bad, may be an overreach. But bear with me. Let me lay the groundwork for that. So if we look at the health risks from genetically modified foods. Um, the first thing is the DNA. That, after all, is where the genetic modification resides. So if we look at the risk evaluation, I mean, we don't eat DNA per se. We eat foods that contain DNA. And as that DNA is, is digested or partially digested in our intestine, I mean, eventually it's going to be completely digested to um, very small parts that are taken up by our set, taken up into our bloodstream and used by our body to make proteins, to make more RNA and DNA, but they're completely broken apart. So for the most part, you don't see any of that residual information getting into our bodies. But here's the interesting thing. Intestinal bacteria are good at picking up pieces of DNA. And some of, the, some of these genetic modifications code for proteins that make plants resistant to, to various uh, insects, and, insects and viruses. For as one example, there is a bacterial toxin, Bt toxin, comes from a Bacillus thurigen, thurigenesis. Um, now, that's a mouthful, which is why it's just known as Bt or Bt toxin. And that's something that those of us who are organic farmers have been using, I mean, I was using it back in the 50s and 60s. It's been around for a long time. So it, it is non-toxic to the environment, um, relatively non-toxic to us. But the question is, if that gene were picked up and now we started, uh, our intestinal bacteria started producing that toxin and, you know, pumping it out into our intestine and we started to take it up into our bloodstream um, would that be a problem? And the, the answer is we're not entirely sure about that. Uh, we know that it's not necessarily harmful to humans. As I say, it's been used by organic farmers for years. But here's the other thing. We've never actually seen this occur in humans. By that I mean um, genetically modified pizza pieces of DNA being taken up by bacteria in our intestines. So this is a, something that's a theoretical risk. It's theoretically possible, but it's never actually been seen. And this is, as I said, only a concern for the foods themselves. The foods contain DNA, but we never eat purified DNA by itself. So this is a concern for genetically modified foods. Let me move into the second category, the proteins that are made from, that are made from genetically modified foods. So Whenever you have a genetic change in the DNA, um, that genetic change is expressed in RNA that's made from it, and that RNA codes for the proteins that that cell makes. So the proteins are, if you have a genetically modified food, there will be usually a protein, sometimes more than one, but usually just one or two proteins that are genetically modified themselves. They're a little bit different from the normal protein, or they may be something that's completely foreign to that food. So here's a concern here. We know that any protein that in a food can result in food allergies. So you could have somebody that could eat corn all day long, 
They're, they have no allergies to any of the normal proteins in corn. But now you put in a foreign protein, and it's perfectly possible that they could have a food allergy or develop a food allergy to that. Um, now, the, prob the problem is, we really don't know how prevalent that is either. Food allergies are very difficult to quantify. The other thing we don't know is how severe that problem is. But if you just extrapolate from what we know about food allergies in general, it's likely to be highly individual. For some, for many people, that foreign protein will have no harmful effect whatsoever. Some people, it might cause a mild effect. But if you think about things like peanut allergies, there's some people who are so deathly allergic to peanuts they can't even be in the room with somebody who's eating peanuts or on an airplane with somebody who's eating peanuts. So the severity of food allergies can be you know, really, tr really tremendous. And I think that's where we see some of these stories about individuals who have gotten very sick by eating genetically modified food. It's most likely a food allergy. Um, now, that doesn't mean that everybody else is going to react in the same manner. But that's the problem. Um, whenever you introduce foreign proteins, you can induce food allergies. For most people, it'll be a non-existent or mild problem. But for some people, it can be very, very severe. So the bottom line is this is a prob probable risk. But the prevalence and the severity of the risk are currently unknown. Um, but once again, this is a concern for genetically modified foods and now also the proteins that come from genetically modified foods. So I think if we talk about labeling gene genetically modified foods, genetically modified, you have the GMO labeling, certainly foods and proteins definitely need to be labeled as genetically modified because they are fundamentally different than foods and proteins that come from non-genetically modified uh, crops. But let's take it to the next step, because these uh, labeling laws also uh, propose to, uh, to regulate sugars, oils, fats, um, emulsifiers, thickeners, all these food components that come from genetically modified foods. These are components that are used in the production of a wide variety of processed foods that are in the marketplace, and also in, in a wide variety of food supplements. So should these be concerned a problem as considered a problem as well? Well, if we look at the risk evaluation here, you know, it, it's a very, very different proposition because these food components are highly purified. There is no genetically modified material left. Remember that genetic modification was in the DNA and it was expressed in the protein. But once you've taken away the DNA and you've taken away the protein, there's no genetically modified material left in that sugar, that oil, that emulsifier thickener, whatever it else was, whatever else was purified from the original original food. So the end products from genetically modified and non-genetically modified sources are chemically and biologically indistinguishable. The health risks of these components is zero. So the bottom line is the health risk of these sorts of uh, these sorts of components, these purified components from genetically modified foods is zero because they're chemically and biologically indistinguishable from the same ingredients from non-GM sources. But we do need to ask whether there are environmental risks or agricultural risks associated with the genetic modification using the genetically modified crops. And that's another issue. Uh, I tend to, you know, because I'm a biochemist, because I've, I, I've taught nutrition and metabolism for years, I tend to focus more on the health issues. But in the environmental issues and the agricultural risk are also things we need to consider. And then finally, the micronutrients, uh, some of the um, phytonutrients that you find in many supplements, <laughs> but also in some processed foods, uh, many cases they come from genetically modified microorganisms, bacteria and yeast that have been modified to produce more of that particular vitamin or phytonutrient. Now, if we look at the risk evaluation here, 
once again, the nutrients are highly purified. Um, so, you know, you don't have no traces of the original genetically modified material left when you get to the nutrients. So once again, the end products from genetically modified and non-genetically modified sources are going to be chemically indistinguishable. And, you know, even better, these are all natural sources because they're using the same bacteria and the same enzymes that we use, that nature uses to produce those vitamins and those phytonutrients. Now, the genetic modification is generally that the enzymes have been amplified so that um, you know these vitamins and phytonutrients can be produced with greater efficiency and lower cost. But once again, the health risks are zero. Um, in this case, there are also no environmental or agricultural risk. This is not a crop. It's a microorganism, a bacteria or yeast, and it's a form of bacteria and yeast that cannot live outside of the laboratory. So the risks from this source are essentially zero. But the labeling laws tend to lump that with all other genetically modified ingredients. So again, um, maybe we need to look at this a little bit more carefully. Now, if we think about health risks, the health risks aren't necessarily just from the genetic modification. Remember those crops where I said 80 to 90 percent of the um, of the crops in this country were genetically modified and the ones particularly where I was talking about in red, the increased herbicide use. Um, you know, these are crops that have been genetically modified to be Roundup ready. Roundup's an herbicide, and the question is, is it innocuous? Is it safe? Um, now, if you look at the main ingredient, glyphosate, that's the active ingredient, and that's the one all the research has been done on, both by Monsanto itself and by some independent agencies. And yes, it's pretty low toxicity. It doesn't bioaccumulate in the environment. Uh, it has relatively low persistence. So the EPA set calls it, says it's, non it's a non-carcinogen and has no adverse health effects expected from lifetime exposure. So you might say, case closed, Monsanto is in the clear, but it's not quite that simple. Because if you actually look at the Roundup itself, it's not just glyphosate. Glyphosate's what's been tested, but it's not just glyphosate. It's also the surfactants, things like Polyethyl, polyethoxylated taloamine, that's the POEA. The POE15 is just a particular variety of that that's used in most of the Roundup that's produced nowadays. And there are some studies, some published studies, suggesting that those surfactants could be toxic to human cells. Um, now, cell studies are, you know, it don't always apply to humans. There is a rat study that's was initially published that suggested that those surfactants might be toxic as well. Now, that was subsequently retracted. And let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, people talk about conspiracy theories and all that sort of stuff. Um, so, let me, you, know, you know, I can't go back and look at the original data because the paper's been retracted. I've read the abstract. I've looked at all the sort of back and forth correspondence with critiques of the study and how the authors responded. So let me kind of talk you through that a little bit. That study suggested that the, um, the use of uh, the Roundup by itself, not just the glyphosate, the Roundup containing the POEA, or in this case POE15, um, that that was toxic to the rats. Um, and so Obviously, that generated a lot of immediate attention. And it started being used, again, if you look at the blogs and the websites, as proof that um, genetic and modified foods were going to kill you. So because of that, it generated a lot of controversy. And the editors of the paper were asked to go back and review the, review the data carefully to make sure that the, the, the conclusions that were being published are being, and actually, if you look at what the authors themselves said, they were very measured in what they claimed. It's once it gets out on the internet and people start making 
you know, bold claims about what that study showed, that you start to run into problems. So the editors were asked to look at that, and they asked the original authors to send them all of their data, and the authors complied. At the end of the day, the editors came back and said, you know, there's no malfeasance on the basis of these authors. Um, they did their study correctly. Um, they didn't hide any data. They shared their data openly. The only thing that, the only problem is that the sample size was too small to reach a definitive conclusion. Certainly not a conclusion the way it was being, the way it was being presented on the internet. So because of that reason, they asked them to retract the paper, and the authors, uh, and the authors consented to that. So that's a long story, but you know it's easy to talk about conspiracy theories and all that sort of thing. That's really the way it went. Uh, the way it went down. I have been uh, I've been associated with studies similar to that in the past, and when I look at their abstract. I could easily understand that the sample size probably would be too small, the number of animals in each group, too small to reach a definitive conclusion. Now, the other thing you need to understand is that if you add, if, when you do animal studies, it is extremely expensive. And to do an animal study with the number of animals that would have been needed to reach a definitive conclusion would be, you know, that, that's a big budget item. It's not something that a scientific lab can do easily unless they get big funding to support it. Um, so the, the, the authors really intended this as a preliminary study, and the idea was to generate some interest and then get more money to do what would really be a definitive study. And I hope that somebody does that definitive study because the, you know, the fact that you have this, this preliminary results that suggest there may be a problem, it means we really should follow up on it. But the other thing is, if you look at Monsanto's research supporting uh, Roundup, you know, they've never shared their data with anybody. So, you know, we really don't know how valid their, their conclusions are. So the bottom line is, while glyphosate, glyphosate itself may be safe, because there are uh, independent studies other than Monsanto's that have shown that it's probably re it's low it's relatively low toxic. Roundup itself may be toxic because of the surfactants that are in uh, that are in the Roundup. So, in my viewpoint, more studies are clearly needed. I don't want to come down on one side or the other of this. I just say that there's a possibility that there may be a problem here, and we need to do more studies so that we really know whether there's a problem. But in the meantime, my concern is we're using 100 million pounds of this a year in the U.S. <coughs> excuse me, in the U.S. alone. That's a huge amount that we're putting in there. If there's any uncertainty, that might not be a great idea. <clears throat> so you might say, okay, that settles it. Um, I don't want to, so that's a very good reason to, to avoid genetically modified foods. Uh, but the interesting thing you may not know is the Roundup risk aren't just for genetically modified foods. It's, Roundup is actually used as what's called a desiccant for non-GMO crops. So what does a desiccant do? A desiccant is something that's sprayed on the crops just prior to harvest. So what happens is it kills the weeds, all the leaves drop off the off the, the crop, and then when you do a me mechanical harvesting, you can harvest the grain or the peas much more efficiently. So this is widely used for wheat, flax, peas, lentils, chickpeas, dried beans. These are not genetically modified crops, but they're sprayed with Roundup just before they're harvested. Um, and so it turns out that the Roundup residues in some of these non-GMO crops are actually higher than for the genetic mo genetically modified crops. Because with the genetically modified crops, you're not spraying Roundup at the end of the season. You're spraying it, you know, during the growing season, early, midpoint, to control weeds. And if this weren't, if this weren't bad enough, there's some even worse herbicides on the horizon. You may have heard this, that 
many of the crops uh, and, and many of the weeds out there becoming Roundup resistant. So Dow, who is <clears throat> Monsanto's biggest competitor, has received permission to market genetically modified pl plants that are not only resistant to glyphosate, that's Monsanto's um, wheat herbicide, but also to the herbicide that they hold the patent for, which is 2,4-D. And to my way of thinking, 2,4-D is more problematic than the glyphosates. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, and I confess I've been around for quite a while now, you may remember Rachel Carlson's Silent Spring. That was a book that was published in the 1950s or maybe early 1960s. Um, and, you know, that was after 2,4-D had been shown to be very toxic to birds. Uh, this was a particular 2,4-D high volatile ester that was used in those days. It's related to the to current 2,4-D, but not identical. But that was very toxic to birds. And so she was envisioning a time at which the birds were completely gone. So hence the title, Silent Spring. Now, even though the 2,4-D is not as toxic as the original 2,4-D high volatile ester, it is still more toxic to birds than it is to humans. Um, and by the way, it's also one of the components that was used in Agent Orange, if you remember that from the Vietnamese War, and some of the servicemen who came home with health issues because of exposure to that Agent Orange. So, you know, it, to me, it's the herbicides that I really am most concerned about. So for that reason, you, you need to really know your supplier. Um, you know, as I say, my risk, my, my opinion is the health risks are more likely due to herbicide exposure than to the genetic modification itself. The biggest problem with the GMO crops is they allow application of 100 million pounds of herbicide each and every year. And that's just in the U.S. So know your supplier. Because what you really want to do is to use a, use, use a supplier that insist on good manufacturing practice guidelines for all of the products that they make um, and do the testing themselves to, to make sure that, they, that these products are pure. Um, because if they do that, they can assure, that, assure you that the proteins and the purified ingredients from herbicide spray plants are going to be herbicide freeze. But you know, there are horror stories out there there are all these companies, and it, you know, there are many times where the FDA has gone in and taken supplements off the shelf, or ConsumerLabs.com has tested supplements and found them to be contaminated with herbicides, pesticides, and that sort of thing, even though they claim they were pure, they were claimed they were organic. So you need to know your manufacturer and then choose one that you can trust to test for purity at every step of the way. <clears throat> I mean, the bottom line is you, the ver verification is, is, it sounds like a nice start, but it's not enough. Certified organic guarantees the plants are produced by organic methods, but it doesn't guarantee the absence of herbicides and pesticides and other toxic ingredients. In the first place, you can imagine you have this farmer, and he's using completely organic processes, but his neighbor is spraying herbicides and pesticides, and those blow over onto his crops, and he gets some contamination. But let me share you a, share a story with you that really brings this to heart. Uh, I was talking with the head of R&D for a major uh, supplement company, and he was relaying a story to me. They were looking for a particular, an, an organic source, a pure source of a particular type of tea leaf. And so he, he talked with some colleagues and they said, you know, we know this area in India where they grow things absolutely organically. They use no herbicides, no pesticides. And that's a place where you should probably go and, and, and source your ingredient. So, you know, he, he, he sent somebody there and they checked it out. Yesterday, they were using organic methods. <clears throat> they brought the samples home, and when the company tested them, they were actually more polluted than anything else they'd seen in a long, long time. It turns out that, yes, 
they were growing, the farmers were growing the crops organically, but their groundwater was contaminated. So just organic certification doesn't guarantee it's going to be pure unless the company has tested to make sure that it's pure. Um, Non-GMO product certification means that non-GMO ingredients are used, but as I told you a minute ago, uh, since these herbicides are also used as desiccants on non-genetically modified crops, it just non-GMO product, product certification doesn't guarantee the absence of herbicides and pesticides. You want a company that tests for purity. So I say unless a company actually tests for the herbicides, pesticides, or the contaminants, you can't be sure that the food is pure and the food is safe. Well, <clears throat> I spent most of my time talking about the health risks. Let's talk a little bit about the environmental risks. So if you look at herbicide resistance, the Roundup Ready crops, the corn, soy, canola, alfalfa, cotton, and sugar beets, um, this is where you're, you know, this is where if you look at the benefits, the people who are advocates of the genetic modification will tell you that yields are improved and the cost is lower and, you know, therefore it's going to feed the world. We do have to be, we do have to, you know, understand that improved yields and lower cost is important. But my concern with this is it encourages the overuse of herbicides, that 100 million pounds a year in the U.S. alone, that increases the risk of environmental pollution. But then we have pest resistance. <clears throat> so this is where you have in, the genetic modification actually makes the, um, makes the food resistant to a particular pest. So cotton is an example of this. Um, now, unfortunately, Many, a lot of the cotton also is Roundup resistant, Roundup ready, but one of the major genetic, the other major genetic modification of cotton is that it makes it resistant to the boll weevil. And that's actually an environmental plus because it means you don't have to spray pesticides on the cotton to kill the boll weevils. Squash, the same sort of thing. It makes the squash resistant to the squash borer. Um, and again, that means you don't have to spay, spray as much pesticides on those crops. So those are actually environmentally friendly. Papaya is an interesting example. This actually is a viral disease that was wiping out the papaya crops worldwide. And really, the only reason that you can still get papayas is that 80% of the papayas now have been genetically modified, so they're resistant to that virus. So again, that's a trade-off. If that is a food you're eating, it's genetically modified. Um, but without it, you wouldn't be able to enjoy papayas. Um, now, again, the environmental risk for this kind of modification is zero because it actually reduces pesticide use. Now, it's where you get to where the ones where you improve the appearance of the shelf life, like the flavor saver apple, the flavor saver tomato, or the apple that doesn't brown when you cut it. Um, the environmental risks are zero, but you know here this is you know this is sort of saying why even go there? There's not a big enough benefit to justify it, and so far the marketplace has borne that out, and those really haven't come into widespread use. Now let's move on to agricultural risk from the from the genetically modified crops. So there are two concerns. One is what we call monoculture, and that. Funny little picture over on the right is a potato that, said that has had potato blight. So let me give you a little bit of history. You may remember it when I start talking about it. But um, in, in Ireland, probably in the, I guess the early, somewhere around the early 1700s, they started relying on one type of potato alone. That was their main cash crop. That was their main food crop. And when the potato blight came into Ireland and wiped out their entire crop, they had no cash, they had no food, people were starving. That's always the problem that you run into with monoculture. Now, I'll point out that that is not unique to genetically modified foods. We do a lot of plant breeding, I'll talk about that, and, and in those cases, we often end up with a monoculture as well. The other concern is the cross-pollination. I talked about that a minute ago. Uh, 
but you can cross-pollinate from one field to the other. So once you have those genetically modified uh, crops out there, it's very difficult to keep you know, to keep the genie in the bottle. But let me come back to the plant breeding, because those two concerns aren't really unique to genetically modified foods. Genetic breeding of plants has been going on since Mendel's experiments with peas in um, 1866. And Luther Burbank, for example, created more than 800 new varieties of plants between 1871 and 1926. Um, and I'll show you some of those in just a minute. Um, Norman Borlaug is, 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 um, developed the high-yield disease-resistant wheat, which is a monoculture because it's the main type of wheat that's grown in many areas of the world. But that's credited with saving a billion, a million lives between, that should be 1940 and 1960, because of the higher, <coughs> because they didn't have problem with the wheat rust virus that was, that was killing off weed and limiting the yields, particularly in developing countries uh, prior to the development of his, his particular uh, hybrid. So just a reminder, hybrid fruits and vegetables are everywhere. The, the varieties of corn, wheat, potatoes, and rice that we currently eat, those are all hybrids. If you look at the specialty fruits and vegetables, plum clots, pluets, clementines, tangelos, boysenberries, strawberries, broccolini, these are all hybrids, and even standard hybrids can have their have their risks. Uh, think of the potato blight, but you know you you the other thing is the hybrid wheat that we use nowadays has an increased gluten content. Some people think that that might be partially responsible for the increase in gluten sensitivity that we see currently. So, kind of bringing things together. When is GMO not GMO? When, and really what I'm saying here is when is it important to distinguish between genetically modified foods and when is it not important? So certainly if we're looking at the whole foods, there are possible health risks. We don't know how many people are going to be affected, uh, but there can be some people who will be affected by those. Um, and there are possible environmental risks due to overuse of herbicides. Um, now the same is true with protein. Uh, the protein itself is genetically modified, so there's some possible health risks, possible environmental risk. Um, if we look at the things like the oils, the sugars, the uh, emulsifiers, all those ingredients I talked about being purified from genetically modified foods, there is no health risk because they're indistinguishable from the same ingredients that are obtained from non-genetically modified foods. Now, there's still possible environmental risks there. Um, and the agri agricultural risks, primarily because of monoculture, are present for all of those. But if we look at micronutrients, <clears throat> those, you know, here we've modified bacteria and yeast. So there's no health risk, there's no environmental risk, and there's no agricultural risk. <clears throat> So that's why I have problems with GMO labeling laws that treat all genetically modified foods and food ingredients the same way. Uh, there are clear distinctions. We can have reasonable differences in terms of um, whether we want to include the oils and, and sugars and other things in the genetically modified labeling laws if we're doing that. We need to be very clear that we're including them in there, not for health risks, but to let people know that there may be environmental consequences to eating, to, to eating, to eating those foods. That we're encouraging the growth of food, the, the crops, um, and when, in use of lots of herbicide. Micronutrients, again, I see no reason for including those in the GMO labeling laws. There's no rational scientific reason for doing that. So why is this a concern? Well, it's a concern because manufacturers plan for non-GMO based on possible health concerns and good science. And as if possible health concerns are whole foods and proteins. Responsible companies start to, started demanding non-GMO protein sources many years ago. 
So the manufacturers have created a pipeline for non-GMO proteins. Those are available. But nobody anticipated a concern about GMO food ingredients that didn't impact either health or the environment. So the manufacturers didn't create a pipeline for those ingredients. And many of the, so because of that, many of the commonly used non-GMO ingredients are currently very expensive or even non-existent. So let me give you an example of what I call the unintended consequences of the proposed um, non-GMO labeling laws. So major cereal manufacturers recently announced that grape nuts and original Cheerios will now be non-GMO. That's great. But they, if you look at the label, it turns out the grape nuts will no longer contain vitamins A, D, B12, and riboflavin. And the amount of riboflavin in Cheerios has gone from 25% of the daily value to just 2%. So why is that? It's because of the difficulty and expense of finding non-genetically modified sources of those vitamins and minerals. Now, I'm not a big advocate of grape nuts and riboflavin as your best source of vitamins uh, and minerals, but this is just the tip of the iceberg. As more and more foods and supplements start to go non-GMO, um, you're going to see more things like this. You're going to see ingredients, important ingredients left out, or the price is increasing significantly. So I call it just the tip of the iceberg. So now let me grab my crystal ball, somewhat cloudy crystal ball, because we're looking into the future here. And, you know, as I say, because they treat all GMO ingredients as equally evil, the current non-GMO labeling laws could be very disruptive if they actually go into effect. But it's likely that they're going to be challenged in courts. It's likely that that's going to be delayed a very long time. In the meantime, my crystal ball tells me that probably the national non-GMO labeling standards will be created that will apply to all states equally. And... Again, based on my crystal ball, which when you get into politics can always be very, very cloudy, I'm going to predict that these, la these labeling standards would be more science-based, more science -based, but they probably won't satisfy the purists. But the other thing I'll predict, and this is more easy to predict, the law of supply and demand will eventually take hold, or if you want to be more cynical about it, where there's money to be made, the American industry will respond. So pipelines for non-GMO ingredients are going to be created. Most non-GMO ingredients will become available. The price will start to go down. The price still may be a concern for complex products with many ingredients. But I think, you know, I can't, my crystal ball isn't clear enough to tell me when, five, ten years in the future, it will be possible to get non-GMO uh, supplements, non-GMO uh, manufactured uh, processed foods at a reasonable cost and with, with uh, you know, with all of their ingredients intact. So, you know, I think eventually we're going to get to where we want to go. We just have to realize that we're trying to go there maybe a little too fast and we're trying to include too many things in these GMO labeling laws.